Good afternoon. My name is Dina Salem. I'm the Managing Director of the House of Lebanon and welcome to part one of Living in a Post-COVID World Back to Business. It's so wonderful to see such a great turnout today. Um, actually, Living in a Post-COVID World is a web seminar series, or webinar series, launched by the House of Lebanon and the Arab American Lawyers Association of Southern California. Uh, its aim is to help businesses and individuals in our community navigate the local, state, and federal laws and practical changes brought about by COVID-19. And today's event is the very first in a, in a series of webinars uh, along the lines. Um, and then before we get to it, I would like to acknowledge Honorable Judge James Cato and Dr. Hanna Shamaz for attending, along with the House of Lebanon Chairman Dr. Paul Wakim and Dr. Muhammad Mike Ahmad, and the House of Lebanon President Joseph Keraki, who would like to take a moment to, tell, to welcome you all today. Uh, Joseph, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Dina, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I want first of all to thank Wafa Habbalah, our CFO at House of Lebanon, for putting the time and the effort, endless effort, to put this event together, along with her team from uh, the Arab American Lawyers Association for making it happen. Uh, COVID-19 might have kept us from meeting at our newly built home at the House of Lebanon, but you know, this uh, virtual meeting makes it, challenge, it makes it even better for us to stay together and make us a, as a tighter and stronger community. In the near future, we will be contacting different organizations or individuals to address different subjects. We're not going to stay on this subject alone. We have many, many more subjects to touch on. We would like to hear from you all attendees to find out what kind of discussions or virtual events would you like us to have as we plan to address a wider variety of topics, whether medical, engineering, future of our cities, future of our streets, future of our businesses. And again, I want to thank you again for all. Thanks for the, uh, the Arab American Lawyers Association for making this happen one by one. Natalie, Crystal, and Hannah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And our three esteemed panelists today are attorneys at law in three national big firms with expertise in labor and employment law. They will bring us today the latest in recommendations and laws that we need to be aware of as we get ready to go back to work with the new normal. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Swiss of Fisher Phillips Crystal Haddad of Jackson Lewis, and Natalie Alamuddin of Blank Rome. And uh, Hannah, over to you now. Thank you, Dina. We are delighted to be here today uh, with the House of Lebanon and the Arab American Lawyers Association of Southern California as part of this first webinar series. All three of us presenting today are on the board of the Arab American Lawyers Association, and we'd like to specially thank Wafa Habola, who has been a long-standing board member and who has connected us with Dina, Joseph, and the House of Lebanon um, to make this program possible. We'd also like to recognize Judge Cato as the founder of our organization. The Arab American Lawyers Association is an organization that has many experienced Arab American lawyers in Southern California and California in various practice areas. Today we're going to talk about employment law issues, but we have various other attorneys that in different practice areas, immigration, bankruptcy, real estate, um, and we just want you to know we are here and available um, to the community. So we hope that this webinar series is really the start of a relationship between the two of our organizations. Before we jump into the substance of today's uh, webinar, I'd like to take a minute to really recognize that the COVID-19 situation has really impacted all of us, not just on this call, but in the world. And so, you know, we've been living in this time of uncertainty and we continue to move forward. So as we enter this week nine, um, we're seeing orders lifting and we're seeing businesses reopening and transitioning to what will be this new normal that we're all going to get used to. 
So given the fluidity of the situation, I would like to recognize that today we will do our best to provide you with our best interpretation of where things stand today. But with this situation, there aren't definitive statements of law at this time. So we'll go over um, high level and we're not going to be able to cover absolutely every state, local, and federal you know, law and the way that they interplay with each other, but we're going to cover some of those key laws that you should be aware of. Given that things are constantly changing, we also ask that you refer to the resources that are constantly updated. We're gonna provide you with some helpful links, but if you'd like to stay updated, you can also reach out to any one of us directly um, and we can add you to our firm email list, which send out legal alerts from each of our firms. So you can stay up to date with relevant legal updates. Um, and you can just go ahead and send an email to us. So that's, that's how you can do that. So um, also, if you're here today and available um, and eligible to get continuing legal education, go ahead and email me directly. My email is there and it's also gonna be at the end of the presentation. Today we'll be covering return to work considerations, workplace procedures and best practices going back as we look to this new normal. Um, I'll be covering the family's first coronavirus response act and some other leave um, issues to be aware of. And then at the end of today's presentation, if we have some time, we will cover some questions and answers. So please feel free to type into the question box as we go through the presentation today. And if we have time at the end, we will cover those questions. If we don't get to them, Natalie, Crystal, and I will email you directly and follow up. And please know that we're here and you're welcome to email any one of us. So without a further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Crystal to get us into our first part of this program. Thank you, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, now, some of you are presently operating your business based on the essential business classification, while others of you have recently reopened based on the May 8th County and City of Los Angeles limited stage two reopening phase, and others of you have businesses which, for the time being, remain physically closed to patrons and visitors. In looking at when your company may open in a full, limited, or modified capacity, employers need to turn to their state, county, and city for guidance on the latest requirements. The state of California breaks down the opening requirements for each industry on their website, covid19.ca.gov. If you click on the resilience roadmap and select guidance as shown on the slide, you will see the various breakdowns in business industries with links and information about the latest guidance and requirements for each industry. This website is updated on a nearly daily basis, so I recommend you check it out frequently. Next, you need to turn to the county for guidance. And focusing on the County of Los Angeles, which I believe is the focus for most attendees today, the county is also providing further guidance for businesses as well. Here, the County of Los Angeles has a roadmap to recovery. As of May 8th, the county has moved to a limited stage two for reopening. Florists, some retailers, including toy, music, and clothing stores, car dealerships, golf course, and trails have opened in a limited capacity with regulation requirements for each. In line with the county, the city of Los Angeles has also synced with the county's stage two for reopening. Based, um, but, what the city of Los Angeles has are additional ordinances which need to be checked periodically for the latest regulations. For example, on May 4th, the city of Los Angeles posted worker retention and right of recall ordinance to recall laid off employees. The ordinance will go into effect on June 14, 2020 and applies to a series of employers, including commercial property, including businesses and retail spaces, shopping centers and industrial buildings, owners or contractors of commercial buildings employing 25 or more janitorial maintenance security services, three, event centers with 100 seats or 50,000 square feet. Next is the hospitality industry, and that's if an employer has at least 50 or more guest rooms, or gross receipts in 2019 exceeding $5 million. And lastly, an airport employer. 
So the way the right of recall ordinance is set forth is about specific priority of offering positions once an employer can rehire its employees. It requires an employer to make an offer to laid off employees in writing and provide the employee five days to accept or decline the offer. A laid off employee is deemed qualified and must be offered a position if the employee held the same or similar position at the time um, at the same site or is or can be qualified for a position with the same training that would be offered to a new worker. So let me tell you what that means. What that means is that in the city of Los Angeles, if you are in one of those five industry groups, which I listed, and you have laid off your employees, you need to offer your laid off employees the vacant positions first before you hire new employees. You need to make the offer in writing, and if five days lapse and you don't hear back, you then need to turn to another laid off employee. Um, if it's for the same position or a position to which that employee can be trained like a new employee. Let me give you an example. If you're operating a hotel and your chef is laid off and you need a receptionist, then the position of receptionist as an entry level position needs to be offered to the laid off chef as well. Look to seniority and then qualification when you are recalling your employees in the city of Los Angeles. Next, here are some general return to work principles to consider. Step one, continue to encourage remote work and telework whenever possible. Step two, if possible, return to work in phases. Consider not bringing your entire workforce back at once. Step three, close common areas where personnel are likely to congregate and interact. Enforce strict social distancing protocols. My colleague Natalie will discuss more on this topic shortly. Step four, minimize non-essential business travel. Step five, strongly consider special accommodations for workers who are members of the vulnerable population. Now, if you are returning your workforce, there are some important considerations to evaluate. First, you want to consider who to bring back. Determine which positions need to be staffed up. Then use a neutral selection criteria to determine which employees will be brought back to fill those positions, such as seniority, performance, or job classification, if some employees will remain furloughed. Consider which employees can or should continue to work remotely based on job, location, or childcare needs, but be careful not to assume someone cannot or should not return based on childcare needs, caregiving responsibilities, or because they fall under the government label of vulnerable population, based on age, disability, or pregnancy. As this may lead to a dis discrimination lawsuit, make sure you are not discriminating based on any other characteristic. For example, don't bring back only male employees, should you select employees based on a characteristic, you may run into a potential discrimination lawsuit. Second, you need to determine whether the employer will provide rehire paperwork for employees who are furloughed or laid off. Now, furlough is not a legally defined term, but it's commonly used to indicate a brief stop of work, but not an actual separation from employment. It is effectively a termination and final wages must be paid if no return date is provided before the end of the pay period, meaning that should the employer not have identified a return date by the end of a pay period, all wages earned and benefits, including vacation and PTO days, must be paid at the time of separation. Should an employer not have paid final wages, statutory waiting time penalties may apply. Those penalties are a person's daily compensation multiplied up to 30 days. Should you not have paid the final wages for an employee who was furloughed or in a permanent layoff, then you want to reconsider providing rehire paperwork as an employee may not have considered their separation a termination. Should final wages have been paid properly, an employee may have employees re-sign new hire paperwork. The new hire paperwork should include updated policies and procedures for operating during the pandemic. Now, some of you operate without an employee handbook, while others do. 
As a labor and employment lawyer, I would recommend having a handbook to show that an employer acknowledges and complies with labor codes. In preparing for your opening, the employee handbook should include the new leave laws related to COVID, which my colleague Hannah will discuss shortly. Modifications to your operation to comply with CDC, state, and other governmental agencies. Next, other con considerations for current and recalled employees is evaluating a reduction in compensation. For exempt employees, it may be a reduction to their salary to meet the minimum salary test of $54,080 a year, or reduce an employee's hours or wages if they are not exempt. If there is a reduction in hourly wages, it cannot be less than the minimum wage. As a recommendation, employers should provide a full pay period before making changes to an employee's wages, meaning that you give them notice with at least a full pay period before you make that change. Also, if you are changing an employee from exempt to non-exempt or vice versa, or even changing the job duties of an exempt employee, you may run into misclassification issues. So there will also be misclassification concerns should you make your employees a 1099 independent contractor. Even before the pandemic, there was an upward trend in misclassification cases. Should an employer reduce hours and wages, the company may qualify for the state of California's work share program. To participate in the work share program, employers must meet a list of requirements, including, but not limited to, at least 10% of the employer's regular workforce or a unit of the workforce and a minimum of two employees must be affected by the reduction in hours and wages. Also, hours and wages must be reduced by at least 10% and not exceed 60%. The employer must fill out the work share program application and work with EDD on whether the business qualifies. The employer must provide the necessary information to its employees to apply for additional funds through the state. At the end of our presentation, we will include the link to the work share program. Next, once you've identified your returned workforce or have one in place, you may have an employee come up to management and refuse to work because of their concerns related to COVID. They may be scared to go back to work. Some recommendations on how to handle this include have the employee document in writing their reasons for not wanting to return to work. Should the employee identify that they are in a vulnerable group, then consider applying the various leave laws, which we will discuss shortly, and engage in the interactive process. The interactive process means having a dialogue with your employee that is documented, showing the employer's response to a possible disability accommodation. Should the concern be that they don't want to catch COVID, it's best to document a response of the company's efforts to comply with guidelines for cleaning and safe operation of the business. Should the employee continue to refuse to work, consider placing that employee on an unpaid leave of absence. It must be made clear to an employee in that category that the company cannot guarantee reinstatement to that position or a similar position. All of this communication should be documented and retained. Should that employee come back in a year and request their job back, you need to turn to that document which states that reinstatement was not guaranteed. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. For my portion of the webinar, I will be covering how to best prepare for having employees return to the work site. There are four main topics and buckets of categories that I will cover. First, I'll discuss new workplace protocols that we recommend implementing as your employees start to return. Second, I'll talk about safety guidelines that we recommend so that employees feel safe returning to the workplace and so that the business can hopefully run just as efficiently and productively as before. Third, I'll briefly cover employee privacy as it relates to medical information. And then last, I'll cover potential issues and litigation risks so that everyone can be advised of uh, potential lawsuits that we are seeing in the COVID-19 era um, and hopefully have all of you avoid getting sued by a potential employee down the line. Okay, so first, covering workplace protocols, it's important that each of you um, creates a plan that you know is unique and works for your company and your workplace premises. There's not a one-size-fits-all and we can certainly assist you, any of the three panelists here can assist you with coming up with a plan that works for you, but here are some highly recommended actions that we recommend taking. 
first and foremost, staggered shifts and breaks. We recommend that if you previously had 10, 20, 50, or upwards of 100 employees that were all starting at the same time at, let's say, 8 a.m. and working till 5 p.m., to stagger those shifts to alleviate the number of employees who are interacting with each other at any given time, especially when they are first coming into the workplace and trying to clock in all at the same time. Um, similarly, with breaks, if everyone used to take lunch breaks together at 12 o'clock, it would be a good idea to stagger this to be perhaps 11.30, 12 o'clock and 1.30, so that a lot of employees are not congregating in the common areas or socializing during lunch hour like they used to before. It's important that we adjust the office layout so that it's not gonna look like the way it did pre-COVID-19. Um, to the extent possible, if there are cubicles or office spaces that are less than six feet apart, we recommend trying to um, change the layout of the workplace and perhaps utilizing common spaces that are no longer going to be used for in-person meetings, such as conference rooms and meeting centers, um, because you know we've all gotten so accustomed to be to doing Zoom meetings and virtual meetings. Hopefully, those will continue, and you won't be having the immediate need to do in-person meetings um, during this time. Social distancing, we're all, sorry, Hannah, parasites. Yeah, social distancing, we wanna make sure that the practices that we all have started to become accustomed to when we leave the place to at least keep six feet away from other employees. Ways that you can do this in the workplace is by changing corridors and hallways to be one way. And you can um, notify employees of this with signage or tape on the ground so that hopefully employees are not necessarily crossing paths with each other unnecessarily when they're going from one office to another or from a break room to back to their office. And then most importantly, cleaning and disinfection is a very important topic that we want to make sure everyone um, is increasing. Um, previously, it might have been okay to have cleaning conducted once per day. Um, during this time, it would be highly recommended to perhaps do this multiple times per day, especially in common traffic areas such as elevator banks, kitchen lobbies, break rooms, and restrooms. And then lastly, sanitizer stations are a relatively easy way to set up, um, you know, to with san employees being able to use sanitizer, especially near the doorways and entryways, especially if there's a common break room area with microwaves or appliances that are used commonly amongst multiple people. It'd be a good practice to also provide disinfectant wipes so that ideally employees can wipe down the station um, after use and so that employees feel more safe when utilizing those types of um, things in the workplace. Okay, additional workplace protocols. I think number one, it's very important to have communications with your employees about what's being done, what's being implemented so that they know what the company is doing to try to protect their safety and making sure that everyone is on the same page. It's also important to implement trainings and conduct training so that people know how to, what the company expects them to do in terms of uh, maintaining social distancing to the extent possible while at the workplace. Um, and also training supervisors and managers on ensuring um, implementation of those policies. So for example, if employees are congregating, um, especially if there are more than 10 people in a, in a kitchen during the lunch hour, we wanna make sure that that gets broken up so that they understand the importance of how the company is taking these protocols. We also want them to be trained um, on what to do if they exhibit, see an employee exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, such as coughing, fever, chills, fatigue, um, what, without actually coming forth and saying that they feel those symptoms and possibly need to send that employee home to maintain the safety of other employees. And also what to do in the circumstance of somebody coming to them stating that they have in fact been infected with COVID-19 and how to approach that. Um, additionally, in terms of um, having employees ideally acknowledged and assent to com not coming into the workplace if they are feeling symptoms or if they've come into contact with someone who has tested positive, it might be a good practice to have them fill out questionnaires attesting to being there because they don't have symptoms and um, haven't come into contact with someone. You know, this is important because a lot of employees might be going stir crazy and itching to come back to the workplace or for economic reasons they might feel compelled to come to work and we want some kind of acknowledgement that they are testing to the company that they don't have these symptoms and then these same types of protocols can certainly apply to visitors vendors and clients if you have the type of business where there are third parties coming on to facility or the premises, we want to protect those employee, uh, those people from spreading, potentially spreading the, the virus at the workplace. And we can implement questionnaires for them, as well as temperature checks, COVID testing, which I'll talk about more on my next slide, and requiring that they wear masks when they come um, to the premises. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so um, workplace safety. I think one of the key things that we would recommend or that companies can now implement, which was not previously authorized, is to actually conduct screenings and testings for employees when they come to work. This can be in the form of temperature checks, such that if an employee has a threshold level of 100.4 degrees, that they can be sent home. We've also now, the, the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission has now authorized employers to actually conduct COVID-19 testing as well, which can either be, on prior slide, please, Hannah, which can either be um, done by, um, uh, um, for the antivirus or for the virus there. And we just need to keep in mind that if somebody tests negative on a certain day, that could very likely change the next day. And then there's two methods for implementing the testing. You can either have employees do a self-check and report this before coming to the workplace. There are um, pros and cons of doing it with this way. It's of course inexpensive and it helps protect employee privacy as if they can do these tests in the comfort of their own home before coming to work. But on the other hand, there can be concerns if they're not being asked forthcoming um, and want to still come to the workplace if they, for economic reasons, want to continue working. And then alternatively, these types of tests can be conducted at work by the employer. And so either we can employ, uh, train an employee on how to conduct this respectfully and in a private manner for employees who are coming to work, or there's also now third party companies that will come in and be able to conduct these temperature checks or COVID tests uh, before employees are entering the workplace. And in terms of um, actual PPE, which is a term I think we've all become familiar with over the last few weeks, it stands for personal protective equipment. We'll wanna look at the specific workplace to see what your needs are in terms of whether this includes gloves, goggles, masks. And it's also very important, like Crystal was saying, to look at local city or county ordinances to see what might be required. So whereas throughout California, there might be recommendations to wear masks when you're in public or interacting with others, in Los Angeles County, it's actually a requirement that employees are, going, are required to wear masks in the workplace. And this changes from county and in Orange County, there might be some cities that have uh, recommendations to wear them, whereas in Costa Mesa, they've implemented a requirement to wear them. So it's good to just make sure that wherever you're located, that you're keeping up with local uh, city and county ordinances. And then lastly, it's very important to come up with an infectious disease response plan so that everyone is on the same page in terms of what to do in the event of someone testing positive because we want to be able to address this um, head on and not reactively um, figure out an approach to what to do in that type of circumstance. Okay, so this is my third topic on employee privacy and I think the question on everyone's mind might be, what happens if one of my own employees actually tests positive? What do I do? So first and foremost, I think it's very important to keep in mind that there are strong privacy protections and HIPAA obligations, such that we cannot, under any circumstances, disclose the name of the employee. Um, that said, it's important that the employer is forthcoming, especially to the employees who have come into direct contact with that employee who has tested positive, that they are made aware of the situation so that they can take proactive measures in terms of whether they need to get tested or self-quarantine because as we're learning, it's not the case where everyone is um, showing symptoms. It's possible to be a carrier while being asymptomatic and they need to know about the situation. This might be depending on the workplace uh, circumstances within the department, or you might need to disclose this to the entire company, just depending on the situation. It's a case by case basis. But we wanna make sure that no matter what we do, we protect the name of the employee and protect the identity of that employee to the extent possible. Um, this also goes in line with data privacy. So whether an employee tests positive or for the screening testing, if you do temperature checks or COVID testing when employees are coming in and out of the workplace, we wanna make sure that this type of information is maintained in a private manner, separate from the regular employee or personnel file of employees that you maintain. So there should be a separate medical file that's kept confidential and to which only authorized users have access to. And then of course it goes without saying that if you do have an employee who tests positive, we wanna make sure that there's heightened cleaning conducted to disinfect the workplace. This can either be, it's case specific, it might even entail having to shut down the premises entirely while this deep cleaning is conducted to ensure the, to hopefully prevent the spread to other employees. Next slide, please. Okay, and now I'd like to discuss some potential issues and litigation risks 
um, that we want you to be aware of. We've certainly seen an uptake in, uptick in some types of lawsuits, and we want to hopefully avoid any of you all from being sued. Um, first, with the furloughs, temporary layoffs, and terminations, as well as selecting who to bring back, it's very likely to be the case where you not, might not be able to bring back everyone at once, and you might need to conduct further layoffs or terminations if business is not rebounding as much as you had hoped when the orders lift. And so when we do these things, we need to make sure that the decisions surrounding who is invited back or who is being laid off or terminated are on an objective basis, such as things like seniority qualifications or the type of positions that um, are need to return. If there's perhaps two people in the same position and you know, one is older and you believe that they're part of a vulnerable population, we want to make sure that that's not the basis for choosing a younger employee to return in that position because that can give rise to a discrimination claim on the basis of age. Similarly, there might be some concerns that an employee of Chinese descent or Asian descent might be more likely to um, have the symptoms or be, be bringing the COVID-19 um, virus to the workplace, especially if they have family members that might have visited um, Asia relatively recently. This is not um, a, a basis for choosing based on race alone, whether to invite an employee back. And so we want everyone to be cautious of um, protected categories under the Fair Employment and Housing Act laws in California, which are probably the most employee friendly in the state, that we're not making any decisions based on a protected category, such as age, race, gender, disability, or any other category. And then um, lastly, with workers' compensation, I'm sure most of you know this is the um, thing that covers um, claims for when employees are injured while at the workplace or while conducting duties in the scope of their employment. Um, just last week, Governor Newsom passed an ordinance which requires in California that there will be a presumption, although a rebuttable presumption, but a presumption that if an employee um, contracts COVID-19, that they will have been, there's a presumption that they've incurred that while at work if they're reporting to work. And so that means that the workers' compensation would cover their claims. And this is something to be wary of in terms of wanting to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make a safe and um, a safe and healthy workplace for employees to return to. And then just some final litigation risks and potential issues to be aware of are wage and hour issues where we want to be sure that particularly under California's labor laws, which are very stringent for things like the temperature screenings or COVID-19 testing or anything that um, requires an employee to take extra time, such as putting on PPE, masks or gloves, if it takes even just a few minutes, this is all compensable time. We want to make sure that they are compensated for this time because otherwise, while there might only be a couple of more minutes now to add to their punch cards and their time data, um, this will result in hefty penalties down the line if it is unpaid. Um, same with reporting time pay. In California, if an employee reports to work and are sent home, they are required to be paid reporting time pay for half the amount of time that they were scheduled. So for example, if someone had an eight hour shift and reports to work and because of the temperature screening, they're not able to actually conduct work, they still need to be paid four hours of time. With remote workers, some of you might still continue to have teleworking employees, uh, which is recommended to the extent possible. We just want to ensure that timekeeping practices are, are met, especially because it'll be harder to regulate without managers and supervisors watching the employees. We want to make sure that they're still taking their breaks, taking their meal breaks before the end of the fifth hour so that additional penalties do not apply, and to make sure that they are uh, reimbursed for business expenses that are necessary to their job. So if the company has not provided a laptop or company issued computer for them to work from or a keyboard or headset or other potential things of expenses, you'll want to look into reimbursing those items so that there are no potential claims down the line. And then lastly, we want to make sure that employees who are entitled to pay time off sick pay, vacation pay, especially in light of the emergency measures that have just been passed by Congress, that we're abiding by all of those new regulations. And I will now turn it over to Hannah to discuss those new emergency regulations in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Crystal. Um, so now I'm gonna take us into the next segment, which is really the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And this section um, will cover two main points, which is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave and Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act. But before I go into that, I would like to mention that this is at the federal level. And so as both Crystal and Natalie have already mentioned today, there are a lot of local and state ordinances to be aware of. 
So I'm covering the Family First Coronavirus Response Act because this applies to employers with one to 499 employees. And there have also been supplemental paid sick leave passed by the state of California, passed by the city of Los Angeles, also passed by the county of Los Angeles. So, um, and also others throughout the state of California. So those have really been gap fillers to this particular um, FFCRA, which is the acronym for this. Um, and so that's why I'm covering this one today. And, but if you would like any further information on those others, you can reach out to me or Crystal or Natalie to provide you with you know, further details on those local um, or state ordinances um, regarding sick leave. So um, also another great resource, because there's a lot of nuance to this section, um, is the Department of Labor has issued the FAQs. And as of today's date, they've issued a total of 93 questions and answers. So there may be some specific questions you have um, related to this topic. A good resource is to go to that link, and we've provided that link at the end of this um, presentation for you to go to. So I'm going to get into it. The first is this emergency paid sick leave. Um, the effective date of this emergency paid sick leave was April 1st, 2020, and it runs through December 31st, 2020. It applies to businesses with one to 499 employees. Um, and for paid sick leave, employees don't have to have any minimum number of hours of days of work um, before they're eligible for paid sick leave. However, paid sick leave is only allowed under six qualifying reasons. And I'm gonna to go to those next. So the six qualifying reasons uh, for emergency paid sick leave the employer must provide an employee paid sick time to the extent the employee is unable to work or telework due to the need for leave because qualifying reason number one, the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. Two, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Three, the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking a medical diagnosis. Four, the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order or self-quarantine as described. The employee is caring for a son or daughter if school or child care is closed or unavailable. And then there's a catch-all for someone that's experiencing other symptoms um, relate, that are similar to COVID-19 as specified by HHS. However, this has not yet been specified and we have no definition for this particular category yet. So let's go into an example, which is helpful. So we have Kim who works for Kanye and Kim Productions, which has 200 employees. Kim decides to quarantine herself for two weeks because she's worried to go into the office. So this is something Crystal raised earlier. It, employees might be you know, worried to go back in. So Kim does not seek a medical diagnosis or the advice of a healthcare provider. Is Kim eligible for emergency paid sick leave? Unfortunately, no, Kim is not eligible for emergency paid sick leave to self-quarantine without a medical diagnosis or advice of a healthcare provider. So it's really important to as Crystal mentioned, document the reason. Um, this one does not qualify for one of the six reasons. So you really have to take close attention to whether or not it's a qualifying reason. So emergency paid sick leave, wages. So how much? So an employee can get up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for full-time employees. And so again, this is a really kind of more nuanced thing to look at, um, the look back period and all of those things. And I could give you more detail on that um, if you'd like separately. Um, qualifying reasons one, two, or three, compensated at the higher of the regular rate, which also includes all other forms of compensation as you're familiar with, bonuses, commissions, things like that. The federal or local minimum wage um, is capped at $511 per day and $5,110 in the aggregate per person. So that's for qualifying reasons one, two, or three. This person can get up to potentially 80 hours, depending on if they, if the look back period and they've worked enough. So qualifying reasons four, five, or six, they're compensated at two thirds the regular rate 
capped at $200 per day and $2,000 in the aggregate per person. So even though the government you know, passed this and employers are supposed to front this cost for it, paying employees these paid sick leave, or as I'll go into the emergency um, FMLA, so the um, time off, the employers are able to get a tax credit. So there are specific requirements to get tax credits. So again, it's really important that if you pay somebody paid sick leave under these reasons, you document them properly, and I'll go into further detail on that. Um, but the qualifying reason does have to be one of these six qualifying reasons to get that tax credit. What are some of the general rules? So sick leave doesn't carry over. As I mentioned, it ends in December. Um, so December 31st, 2020 is the when this is to end. Um, an employer may not require an employee to use other paid time provided by the employer before, before using this paid sick leave. That was a big area um, of controversy before, you know, can the employer require this um, employee to use other kinds of paid sick leave? And it's very clear you cannot require the employee to use other sick leave before this sick leave um, or other paid time. So the employer may not require the employee to find a replacement to cover scheduled hours. And so then I'll take us into the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act. Again, the effective date was April 1st, 2020, and it ends also December 31st, 2020. It applies to businesses with one to 499 employees. And here, there is a requirement that the employee must have worked for 30 days. So unlike the emergency paid sick leave, which has no minimum day requirement, this one, the employee must work for at least 30 days. And there's only one reason that someone can take this kind of leave. And the reason is that the employee is unable to work or telework due to the need for leave to care for the son or daughter under the age of 18 of the employee who is in the school or place of care has been closed or the child care provider of such son or daughter is unavailable due to a public health emergency. So as you know, most of us know, all these schools have been closed, places of child care have been closed. So this one reason provides 12 weeks of job protected leave for this employee. Um, but again, it's important to document that this school has been closed or their child care is not available. So how does this work? So the first 10 days of this leave is actually unpaid, but the employee may substitute in other kinds of paid time off, and that's at the employee at the employee's discretion. Um, oops, the slides are. <laughs> so um, I lost the rest of that slide. So anyways, so after the first 10 days, the rest of it is paid at two thirds of the employee's um, rate for the remainder of the leave, so the, for the remainder of the 10 weeks. What kind of job restoration um, does the employee get? So if the employer has 25 or more employees, then the employer must restore the employee back to their position um, under the FMLA standard. If the employer has less than 25 employees, then this restoration reinstatement provision does not apply. So here's a scenario that I'll take you into to help illustrate this. Nancy A, she's a famous singer, has been employed full time for 20 days at an elite music center which employs 40 people. Nancy is not eligible to receive any paid time off under her employer's policies. Nancy has a sore throat and a fever of 100.7 and cannot report to work. Nancy is seeking a medical diagnosis for her symptoms. What benefits is she entitled to while she is not working? So she's only been there 20 days, but remember with the paid sick leave, there's no minimum day requirement. And she is sick and it sounds like she might be, you know, experiencing symptoms related to COVID, and is seeking a medical diagnosis. So because of those reasons, she would be entitled to emergency paid sick leave. And she's a full-time employee, so 80 hours at a regular rate. However, she would not be entitled to Emergency Family Medical Leave Act because she was not employed for at least 30 days. 
and is also not the qualifying reason. Here's another example. Nancy has been employed full time for 45 days at an elite music center, which employs 40 people. She's accrued three days of vacation. The school where Nancy's fifth grade daughter attends is closed until the end of the school year. Nancy is unable to work as a famous singer from home during this time. What benefits is she entitled to receive during this time? So she's entitled um, to the emergency paid sick leave of 80 hours, but this time at two thirds her regular rate of pay. And that's because it's reason, it's reason four, five, or six. And then she's also entitled to the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act of up to 12 weeks of job protected leave. The first 10 days are unpaid, but she could substitute in the emergency paid sick leave. After 10 days, Nancy's paid two thirds her regular rate of pay. And Nancy may elect or be required to use her three days of vacation after the first 10 days. What are some issues common to both the emergency paid sick leave and the emergency family medical leave act? So exemptions are one of those common um, issues. There are exemptions allowed for, for healthcare providers and emergency responders. There's also a very limited exemption for small businesses. And this exemption only applies to the one reason and it's that reason to care for a son or daughter and the employer must have 50 or less employees. And also the fact that they providing this leave would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. There's no application, but documentation must be provided. So it's really important though to note that if you have 50 or less employees, you're not automatically exempt from all of the qualifying reasons. It's only this one reason. And then there's also notice requirements for employers. So employers must post a notice regarding both requirements of emergency paid sick leave and this emergency family medical leave act. So um, there's a model notice that has been created by the secretary of labor. Um, and if you want, I can provide that to you or you can go to the website, which we have provided to you as well. Um, and then, so a leave request form, going into the documentation. So the leave request forms um, should be signed by an employee that includes the following. The employee's name, the date the employee is requesting the leave, a statement of the COVID-19 related reason for the leave, and written support for the reason. So a statement that the employee is unable to work or telework because of the COVID-19 qualifying reason. So these are the exact things that must be documented and then I'm gonna go into the written support that should be provided. <clears throat> so the employee's request form, this is a sample request form that we have um, basically for the emergency paid sick leave and also for the emergency family medical leave act. Written support for specific leave, subject to quarantine or isolation orders for that was qualifying reason number one, you should have the name of the government entity or order um, of the quarantine. To be advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine should have the name of the healthcare provider. And then caring for an individual subject to quarantine or self quarantine, they should have the name of the person or relationship of that person and the name of the government entity or healthcare provider. Additional documentation for um, someone that has to care for somebody of school age, um, the son or daughter. So the name, um, age of the child, the name and the place of care, um, representation that no other person will be providing care for the child. Um, this is important because there should be a, just one person providing care um, if taking this leave. And then also there's IRS guidance that says if a child is over 14 and needs care during daylight hours, a statement that special circumstances exist requiring um, the person to stay with this child. So that's important documentation. So again, I told you there's good IRS guidance. I think also accountants can um, provide some good help in this area as well with regard to credits and the IRS guidance. Um, relationship to other leave laws um, and leave laws. So emergency paid sick leave is in addition to other sources of leave. So as I mentioned, there's other paid sick leave. Um, you know, as we know, California local and state. 
So we had those leaves, uh, the paid sick leave ordinances, even before all of this came about, those stay intact. This is in addition to. Um, the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act does not increase the overall 12 weeks of leave that an employee would otherwise be entitled to. So they're not now entitled to 24 weeks of leave. They're entitled to only 12 weeks. There is just one additional qualifying reason. Um, the new leave law is also not retroactive. So employers do not have to pay the employees for taking the time off before the law went into effect. And as kind of Natalie mentioned earlier as well, um, you know, really we have to be on the lookout for what are the consequences if we don't comply. So if an employer doesn't comply, um, you know, there are obviously consequences in the form of litigation and the employer and the employee coming back and suing. Um, but here are some of the things they could come back for, right? So if we basically discharge, discipline, or discriminate against somebody for taking leave, um, paid sick leave, or the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, you know, you could be subject to any of those. Um, also, for not providing the paid sick leave, there could be a claim for minimum wage for each hour of paid sick leave, and then also liquidated damages, and then costs and reasonable attorney's fees, which are usually the driver of these cases. And then also the Secretary of Labor may bring an action. So before we go into the very end here of our presentation, and Natalie will take us you know, through some of those resources we mentioned, and we can take a couple questions that I've seen come through here. Um, I'd like to leave you with just that, you know, this is really a process. As we have already been persevering through this situation, we, will, we are now in the process of planning and preparing to go back and to perform. And other things are gonna come up, and this is not going to end most likely in a month or in two months. Um, and it will be a process. So, you know, this is a process for all of us that we're going through together. And we three here would like you to know that we're available if, you know, questions or issues come up during this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Natalie, and then we can get into a couple of the questions. Thank you, Hannah. And like Hannah mentioned, this we wanted to put together some resources and links for additional information because we know there was a lot of information to pack into 60 minutes. And so for additional, additional details and guidance, these are some great resources that we've listed here. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is being regularly updated and is the best resource in terms of guidance and recommendations that employees should be following. Both the EEOC and the DFEH websites. Um, the EEOC is uh, federal guidelines. The DFEH stands for Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which is California specific. They have excellent resources and um, FAQs in terms of complying with various California laws um, as they relate to employment matters and discrimination laws and best practices. We've also listed here the Department of Labor's FFCRA questions and answers, which go into a lot of details um, that Hannah was just discussing in terms of implementing the various emergency sick leaves and family leaves that have been implemented. The Cal OSHA guidance is for um, workplace safety and recommended practices with PPE and protecting workers who are coming to the workplace. And then lastly, Crystal touched upon the work share programs and the specific requirements that are required, which you can find at this link here. And then a couple of other helpful links um, include the California specific roadmap that has been recently issued um, by Governor Newsom, as well as I've included a link here to a return to work checklist, which covers a bunch of different categories that you wanna be thinking about as you return. Um, we have a few minutes left, and so we will turn it over to questions, but I first wanted to mention that we have recorded this presentation and we'll circulate the recording and the slides um, so that you guys all have that as future reference um, moving forward. And then also any three of us on the panel would be more than happy to address any follow-up questions and specifics, especially to the extent that we cannot get to all the questions today. Um, I might, I saw a question come in through the chat, so I might just kick it off. Um, one question that an employee, uh, that one of, one of the attendees had is, if there was an employee who was planning to um, go on maternity leave in early June, prior to um, the entire COVID stay at home orders coming into place, if the company has reopened and is still operating, it's a best practice to still 
um, have that employee go ahead and take that maternity leave, which is job protected, um, try to maintain that position unless there's a reasonable business justification for why you might not be able to, and to have them instead come back in a comparable position. But we wanna make sure that aside from the emergency measures that <coughs> Hannah just covered, that we're still um, following the FMLA, CIFRA, which is the California specific um, uh, medical leaves, and also um, uh, the family paid leave for um, ensuring that we're not discriminating against or treating employees differently for needing to go on disability leaves, including maternity leave. And then secondly, and I can turn this over to um, Hannah to discuss in further details, there was a question related to what to do when you work in a shared workspace, such as we work. Um, in terms of safety protocols and informing tenants of COVID cases in the building. Um, you know, it's very important to initiate a dialogue with the landlord in terms of expectations of what to do in the common spaces, the lobbies for elevator banks, signage in terms of limiting the number of employees that you recommend entering the uh, elevator, setting up sanitizer stations and working together to come up with a plan that can help best protect the com people coming in and out of that workplace. Um, and uh, um, I will turn it over to either Crystal or Hannah for any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, so I just, a few additional thoughts um, in regard to shared workspaces, um, and it kind of touches on even earlier. So if, if we had somebody that tested positive as well, which is an important consideration in the shared workspace, it's important also not only to advise uh, your workforce, but also, you know, building other shared spaces that this you know positive employee may have come into contact with so that's another important consideration when we talk about work shared workspaces um other things too is also have definitely having a dialogue but having your own documentation as to how to you know carefully navigate through the situation your safety protocols but also looking at the agreements you have um, with others that you're sharing space with or with the landlord um, and making sure that you know you're doing everything you can to make sure you're following safety protocols um, and potentially get indemnification or things like that if you know it is the fault of someone else um, around you so those are some other things crystal do you have any other thoughts yeah just make sure that you're documenting these communications as you go along um, you want to make sure that you're communicating with co-tenants. You want to make sure that you're communicating with your landlord and that it's in writing. So that way you can refer back to it. Um, also, one other thing I wanted to add about the pregnancy leave, just because I recently litigated this issue, um, but it's very fact specific as any, you know, as any one of us here would say. But what's also important to consider is the number of employees that you have. So if an employer has less than five employees, then PDL and CIFRA don't apply. So it's very fact specific. We can do a deeper dive for you if you'd like. Um, but it, you, know, you have to consider the amount of employees and whether or not there's also joint or co-employer relationships um, with potential PEOs, things like that. Okay, and then just one other question and then the other questions will follow up. Um, but one other question was, what about return to work considerations with 60 plus? employees. So a lot of the return to work considerations we provided today, um, they do, a, they apply to all employers. Um, and really, that's, it's a good point because these return to work considerations too are very industry and fact specific. So this is a general overview and a general guideline. However, your specific industry, you know, could be construction, could be um, retail, could be restaurant may have more nuanced considerations so that's one thing to keep in mind but generally speaking these you know these apply to an employer that would have 60 plus so with that i we really appreciate being here today and um are so happy that we had this opportunity and please do feel welcome to reach out to any one of us um, if you have any further questions